Okay, class. Next lecture, Christianity and Rhetoric. Just to review, we've gone through the origins of rhetoric. We did Greek rhetoric with Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Isocrates, Gorgias, Phaedrus. We've done Aristotle's rhetoric, and we talked about Roman rhetoric, including Cicero, Quintilian, and Longinus on the sublime, and all the developments in Greek and Roman culture. So now we're going to move on to what happened to rhetoric after Christianity arrived. So obviously there's a point in the development of the history of the Roman civilization where it became the Holy Roman Empire, where Constantine, the emperor, decided that Christianity was the official religion of the empire. And so the role that rhetoric fulfilled in a pagan or pre-Christian society was taken over by a Christian society. So let's see what happened to rhetoric as a result of it. So let me start out with a funny question. Might not even seem relevant to the topic or lecture, but it's an interesting one nonetheless. And that question is, what does God need with a starship? Now, where is this question coming from? The person you see, the character that you see there on your screen, is Lawrence Luckinbill. He's an actor, and he played a character in one of the Star Trek movies called Cybok. He was uh, Spock's brother, but the difference between him and Spock is that he had emotions, whereas Spock is very logical and emotionless. If you don't watch Star Trek, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> anyway, they travel to this planet where they find a being who they think is God. And after they've talked to him for a while, he asks, how did you find me? And uh, Cybok says, we came by a starship. And God says to him, could you take me on your starship so I could spread my um, truths or teachings about love throughout the galaxy? And Cybok says, yes, of course we can do that. And then one of the other characters, I think it's Captain Kirk or somebody, chimes in and says, wait a minute, why does God need a starship? In other words, he was basically saying, if God is God, he's the all-powerful, almighty, omniscient, omnipresent being that has absolute unlimited power, why would he need help to get his message across? And <clears throat> this, of course, is the undoing of this creature who is actually not God. He's an evil creature, but he's very powerful. And so the question arises, if um, God has revealed himself to human beings through scripture or revelation, then why would you need rhetoric to get the point across? In other words, why do preachers pre why do preach? Why do people evangelize? Why do people try to convince other people to believe in God? Why do they say that their religion is better than some other religion? Um, it's an interesting question. If God is so powerful that his existence is everywhere made manifest in the universe and is obvious and self-evident to some people, uh, then why is it that you need uh, a vehicle like rhetoric, argument, persuasion to convince people to accept that? Well, one of the simple question, answers to that question is <clears throat> when you think about when Christianity was new, it basically was converting people who had an earlier form of monotheism, Judaism, no form of monotheism, paganism, like the Romans did, um, or maybe no religion at all or different various religions. But it was replacing something that they already believed. And so therefore, there was some need for argumentation to show that what was replacing what they already believed was superior as a belief system or as a religion. Another way of thinking of it is that you were giving a narrative to the people who might be converted, let's say, to Christianity, that Christianity was a superior method for uh, achieving your relationship with God and ultimately salvation. Now you have to also remember that throughout Europe in the time of the early uh, uh, the time of the Roman Empire and in early Christianity many people were poor illiterate peasants they didn't read they couldn't read scripture um, they weren't educated so they weren't 
familiar with any linguistically based written version of any account of God, Old Testament, New Testament, the Bible, Jesus Christ, or anything else. And so it was only through narrative means and through storytelling and through persuasion that was very simple and geared toward an illiterate, uneducated audience that the message of salvation or uh, accepting a particular religious belief could be got across. And that, of course, is the province of rhetoric. How do you use language, symbols, ideas to get across? So what does God need with a starship? Somebody like St. Augustine would say, being a very educated and, and intellectual, philosophical, and literate man himself, that that the truth of God and what's in Scripture about God is revealed to him by the nature of his own understanding. But to other people, it would not be revealed because they are they're not educated and don't have those insights. So let's examine this a little bit. First, let's talk about how rhetoric functioned in a pre-Christian religious environment, which is basically the Greek, the pagan. In Greek religion or Greek theology, gods were actually reconfigurations of human beings, as you know. Zeus, Hera, uh, all the other Greek gods were attractive, human-like beings with powers. They obviously had very great powers, but they were limited because they fought with amongst themselves and actually undermined each other. So they were very human. Um, Greek religion didn't particularly forbid anything. There weren't any mores against uh, certain types of sexual behavior. Uh, there was both homosexual and heterosexual sex. There was sexual promiscuity. The Greek gods for, often took the form of humans to have sex with humans and so forth. Religion didn't interfere with the advancement of any subject, including science, philosophy, and rhetoric. So rarely, for example, as has happened with Christianity, would somebody make a scientific pronouncement and therefore learn that the church or some religious belief was in conflict with that and therefore be in trouble. Like, for example, which happened to Galileo during the Renaissance. And um, iconography was a significant element of Greek religion. As a, as a matter of fact, the word icon is a Greek word. And of course, an icon is a representation of something. It could be a pictorial representation or some other graphical representation like a statue. So let's talk about um, an icon of a Greek god, which is Zeus. Zeus was the head god. Um, you know, he could throw his thunderbolts down from heaven. So here he is. He's very, very human as the Greeks depicted him and saw him. Uh, this statue, which is in Athens, um, depicts him throwing one of his thunderbolts. And uh, you can see he's a fully formed adult uh, male. He's got all the equipment of a male. And, um, and this is the way that the Greeks conceived of their gods. Look at his characteristics. He's male. He's human. He's sexual. He's athletic. He is lustful. If you've read the Greek myths, you know that. He had a temper. If he got mad at people, he would definitely um, get revenge. And he was meddlesome. The, the Greek gods uh, cared that the uh, humans worshipped them and uh, would punish them for not worshipping them correctly and definitely got involved in human affairs. Okay, so the transition from pagan to, Christi to Christianity uh, is, is, is a transition from uh, a polytheistic, sometimes just called a paganistic religion with multiple gods, to a monotheistic religion, meaning a religion that believes in one god. And notice that I say with an explanation, there were two kind of interesting dimensions of the development of Christianity that raise some issues about the, the pure use of the term monotheism. The first one actually is even before Christianity, it's with the Jews in the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, um, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, there were several authors of the Old Testament who wrote in different styles. Some of the earliest authors always referred to God in a plural sense, as if God was a set of what we call hosts or angels that that there was a collective 
uh, sense of God, that God wasn't just one thing. Uh, later on, the idea that God was just one thing was developed actually as a major component of Judaism. But you do have that internal kind of conflict. The other, of course, exception to the notion of monotheism as opposed to paganism or polytheism is, is that some people allege that Christianity itself is not a strictly monotheistic religion. It starts with the idea of one God, but then adds in the dimension, which actually sounds a little bit Greek, that the God mated with a human, produced a human offspring, and then that offspring was himself uh, ascended to his father to become part of the heavenly community uh, of, of godlike creatures. And then there was also a spirit. Uh, so uh, what, what's called a... Um, a um, a trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit. And some people say that actually is taking the idea of one God and splitting it into three parts, unity and non-unity at the same time. Okay. Um, Christianity, as opposed to um, um, uh, the Greek myths and the Greek legends, is canonical and scriptural, meaning that a lot of it's based on the actual narrative which describes who Jesus was, the life he lived, how he died, how he was resurrected, but also there's also the the laws and the uh, the dogma that develops as a result of the development of a religion. So a lot of the things, for example, that the early Catholic Church developed as rules weren't strictly scriptural, they were outgrowths of interpretations of scripture. Um, and um, like in the classical sense of the Old Testament, but also of the Greek um, poems, um, it went from an oral tradition where these were stories that were told to the point where they were written. Somebody decided, let's record them. And of course, that meant that they had to condense and combine and overlap. As a matter of fact, one of the things you see in the Old Testament, much more than the New Testament, because of its massiveness and its multi authors and it's a long period during which it was written you actually see stories that seem to conflict overlapped or tell the same thing differently a lot of times that happens in Genesis for example those are called redactions um, so it raises the question by the way about the Bible um, about when it was written and who wrote it and let me click on here so you'll see this website real quick and this is a website that shows you um, the years at which the uh, major books of the Bible, first the Old Testament, you see that up there, were written. And you see uh, the first five books, sometimes called the Torah, supposedly written by Moses, all the way back to 1400 BC. And then a lot of the Bible written actually over a thousand years later at the time of King David. Um, and, uh, and then you have other books written during the time of prophecy and of course you have the New Testament and note that the New Testament all the authorship is basically at least 30 to 50 years after the crucifixion of Christ which again adds to the elements of whether the narrative has good fidelity with what actually occurred okay so uh, because of that there is a lot of redaction again overlapping combining and you get great historical discrepancies and raises questions of historicity and so forth. And the one theory, of course, is the documentary hypothesis. You may have studied this if you've ever studied the Bible, is that especially the Old Testament had different authors. And these authors are represented by the letters J, E, P, and D. And in a minute, I'll talk a little bit more about what those are and what they represent. Now, the Old Testament God, I'm not talking about the New Testament God now, um, actually had some things in common with the Greek gods. First of all, the Old Testament God is actually described as jealous. Like if you turn your attention to other false gods or idols, he will get, he will not appreciate that. He's jealous. Uh, he will get angry. Um, he has human attributes in that, you know, he gets mad and we are said to be made in his image. So if in his image kind of says that we look like him. And a lot of artists like for example, Michelangelo has depicted that God is actually an old man and he created a young man that looked like him. And interestingly, in the Old Testament, God is uh, portrayed as very human in the sense that there are frequently situations in which 
God and human beings enter into a discourse in which the purpose is to try to persuade. That's a very interesting rhetorical aspect of the Bible. You remember, for example, that when, uh, if you know the Old Testament, when God was threatening to uh, destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham convinced them that those cities should be spared if he could find ten men who were not wicked, right? And God uh, basically agreed to this after he had already said that he was going to destroy it uh, no matter what. So there have been some times, and you probably remember when Moses first encounters God, he argues with him. God basically tells him, don't argue with me, but they still are having an argument. Uh, the four authors, J, standing for the Yahwehist, that's, those are people that refer to God as Yahweh or in the Hebrew Adonai. Elohim, those are the early writers who I told you refer to uh, God as a your, a, um, as a multiplicity, a collective noun. That's a plural word, another name for God. Uh, the priestly, uh, which basically it looks like they were written by priests in the temple in um, Jerusalem at a much later date. And the Deuteronomies, that's of course the, the law is laid down by the Deuteronomist, laid down by Moses in the books of the Torah. Okay, so let's talk about iconography a little bit. Now let's not talk about Greek iconography. Let's talk about Christian iconography. So here's the uh, painting I just mentioned before. It's by Michelangelo. It's on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel where they just elected the new pope. And it's usually called, And God Created Adam. Adam is a fully formed adult male. And his heavenly father is an elderly man, also very muscular, but definitely mature and old. Okay, now one of the things about iconography is that it, it, it comes into conflict with one of the Ten Commandments. You remember one of the Ten Commandments is, Make unto thee no graven images. Well, the, the original Jews took that very literally, that they're not supposed to make any images uh, representing anything on earth, not just godly things. Uh, anything that you could sculpt or make a picture of, you could end up worshiping because it had some innate beauty in it which you would put above God. So, if, for example, if I painted a picture of a beautiful woman, I could begin to worship the picture um, because it's, it's so beautiful and that was what they were trying to resist. So you, did, you generally do not see the idea to go toward artistry, sculpture, painting, or any other representation of things. Um, Judaism was originally what we call an iconoclastic religion, meaning that it was an idol tearing down religion. I don't know if you remember the legend that when Abraham was a little boy, he had his revelation there was only one God, and he broke all the idols in his father's shop because his father sold idols. Well, that's iconoclasm, breaking down idols or breaking down uh, representations of God. Early Christianity was itself iconographic because since so many people who were being converted to Christianity uh, were not literate, were not part of the primary Jewish population that they originally attempted to persuade that Jesus was the actual Messiah foretold in the Jewish Bible. Um, many of the early Christians had to be presented Christianity iconographically, either through stories or for through pictorial representations. So things like the crucifix became very powerful symbols and images for people. And the Roman Catholic Church uh, as it establishes a bureaucracy, would preserve this by telling the stories through sculpture, painting, representation. If you've ever traveled in Europe, virtually every church in Europe is, especially Catholic churches, is full of the iconography of Christianity. It tells the story of the life of Christ, um, and so forth. Now, the Protestant Reformation, which took place after the Renaissance in Northern Europe, actually went back to the Jewish idea of making religion iconoclastic and tore down the a lot of the what they viewed as idolatry of the Catholic Church. That was one of the main points of disagreement between the two religious views of Christianity. So here's an example. This is St. Peter's Catholic Church in Rome. It's where the Vatican is. And you can see how iconographic that church is. This church is full with sculptures, paintings, reliefs. Every inch is filled with a picture, a depiction of something that happened in the life of Jesus or the life of a saint 
or Mary and so forth. Every story just rings true with the faith. And it's a very important and powerful element of Catholicism that it be iconographic. Contrast that with a New England Protestant church uh, during what's called the Great Awakening period of American history and you see there's no pictures, no statues, no stained glass windows, no paintings, no representations. There's not even a crucifix. When you see a cross in a Protestant church, you tend to see a cross without Jesus portrayed on it, but just the cross itself. It represents the same thing, but doesn't show any depiction of God or anything else. Uh, here's a synagogue. This synagogue is ornate, meaning it has a lot of decoration. But again, it is not iconographic. It doesn't have... Uh, pictures of Moses or any of the famous Old Testament prophets and if they're stained glass they're probably just designs that have to do with letters or numbers or symbols that are purely out of the the words or the logography but not the iconography of the religion so comes back to the question what does God need with a starship well, that's a complex answer, and let's see if we can look at it a little bit. First of all, I've already mentioned that in the early church, there was a lot of illiteracy. So, why did God need assistance in getting his message across? Uh, because a lot of people couldn't understand that message. There was simply no way for them to understand. Plus, you were dealing with fragmented communities, communities from all different languages, cultures, races, all over North Africa, Western Europe, England, the Middle East, as far as Christianity was spreading at the time. So, again, a unifying thing would be one way of presenting the, quote, truth, the good news of Christianity, and make it palatable to people who couldn't otherwise understand it. Also, people could use visual rather than linguistic iconography. It wasn't just that they were hearing a story. They were also seeing. It represented in art. There was also what I would call an Aristotelian view of the audience. In Aristotle's rhetoric, he talked about the fact that audiences weren't very smart. I had mentioned that during my other lecture. And as a result, those audiences weren't likely to understand very complex or sophisticated arguments. Similarly, people in Europe who were illiterate and didn't understand the Bible, or for that matter, any other revealed text, were not likely to understand it without you watering it down for them in terms of things like symbols. Also, very simple kind of base psychological fear appeals worked, worked very well. They're right out of rhetoric. And um, the idea, for example, that if I could scare you into the idea of damnation or reward you with the idea of salvation. Um, obvious ways that rhetoric would work in an early form of the Christian church. So here's an iconography that an early Christian either through verbal means or pictorial means would be exposed to. The icon of Jesus versus Satan. This would be a powerful image for someone who is being introduced to the notion of Christianity. One of the other things that happens when you introduce iconography into um, religion is the idea that the icons are religious symbols but they also are representations of flesh. So by embracing iconography, the church embraces the duality of man and God. Perhaps a pagan idea is that God is mating with humans. God's invisibility is transformed into human images. So for the ancient Jews, they really wouldn't say anything about what God looked like. Um, as a matter of fact, there's a famous scene in the Old Testament where God is actually going to pass in front of Moses, but... Moses has to turn so he can only see God's back because no human can look into the face of God and handle the overwhelming power of looking into his face. So here's an interesting ex examination of what I'm talking about. Um, uh, the notion of sacred and profane love, which is actually the name of, um, of a painting that I'll show you in a minute. But this uh, sculpture, which is in... Um, St. Peter's in Rome. It's called The Ecstasy of St. Teresa. And it talks about uh, an event that occurred between her and an angel. 
Okay. Now I'm going to read you on the next slide the description, and it's not going to sound entirely like a religious experience. Follow along with me. The sculpture relates to the life of a mystic nun who wrote about an experience of being visited by an angel. Beside me on the left appeared an angel in bodily form. He was not tall but short and very beautiful. His face was so aflame that he appeared to be one of the highest ranks of angels who seemed to be all on fire. In his hands I saw a great golden spear and at the iron tip there appeared to be a point of fire. This he plunged into my heart several times so that it penetrated my entrails. When he pulled it out I felt that he took them with it and left me utterly consumed by the great love of God. The pain was so severe that it made me utter several moans. The sweetness caused by this intense pain is so extreme that one cannot possibly wish it to cease, nor is one's soul content with anything but God. This is not a physical but a spiritual pain, though the body has some share in it, even a considerable share. So basically, I mean, this is a religious experience that she's describing but it also sounds like a sexual experience I think that's pretty obvious and so that's one of the things that we see when we iconographize religion is that we make religious experience into human experience and a lot of human experience has to do with sexuality and pleasure similarly in this famous painting by Titian sacred and profane love you see the two varieties of love uh, one is obviously sexual and the other is much more modest. And all the people that sculpt religious figures throughout history uh, seem to combine the fact that these are both religious stories, but that these people are also real, and therefore they have the dimensions of other aspects of being human rather than just the religious dimensions. So this, of course, is the famous sculpture of David by Michelangelo, sculpted during the Renaissance. And it's interesting because he decided to sculpt a giant sculpture like they did of the Greek gods back in ancient Greece. And this is a definitely a throwback to ancient Greek sculpture. And of course, all the ancient Greek sculptures were nude and athletic and handsome. And he did that same thing, but he decided to do it with a biblical figure. And of course, he's perfectly proportioned. And he's very sexualized, but he's also a hero from the Bible. So, as I mentioned before, there's an argument tradition in the Bible. There's also a lot of linguistic traditions, psalms, songs, proverbs. Rhetorical figures are used throughout the Bible. You know, Jesus oftentimes speaks in parables or metaphors. Um, there are rhetorical purposes in the Bible. Sometimes something in the Bible is very self-serving. Self like, for example, when Moses talks about invading the indigenous populations when the Israelites go back into the Holy Land, that actually was going on at the time the Bible was being written. So it sounds like a justification for what was going on contemporaneously. Longinus is on the sublime, as I mentioned, has been a way of looking at the Bible as sublime literature. So the reading of the stories has the overpowering effect that the iconography has on the believer. The Book of Job is one of the most philosophical books of the Bible in which there's an actual debate between God and Job about the nature of God and the nature of Job as a, a sinner or a non-sinner and whether he deserves to suffer. And the Bible ultimately is both Greek somewhat and anti-Greek because I told you there's a lot of elements of Greek, the, uh, the interaction of human and, and God-like creatures, but also the fact that so much of what's in the Bible uh, um, attacks and assails elements of Greek culture. For example, in Greek culture, homosexuality was totally accepted. It was the preferred form of sex. And yet, in both the Old and New Testament, it's discouraged and called sin. Okay. Um, three, uh, uh, a couple of people that you need to know about from the early Christian church. Augustine, sometimes called Saint Augustine, started out as a pagan rhetorician and was converted and became one of the early doctors of the church believed in original sin and the election of the righteous. So basically, it's already been decided who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. He believed strongly that Plato had one of the strongest philosophical systems, merged it with Christianity. So in the same way that Plato thought truth was rationally revealed, he felt that Christian truth was rationally revealed. And he felt the need to morally justify the use of rhetoric because the issue of whether God needs a starship was one that concerned him.
Later on, Martianus Capella, who created the famous liberal arts that you study in college. There are actually seven of them. Here's a link. The trivium, the original three, grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And then the quadrivium, four, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Um, also, during the Middle Ages and later on, we'll learn a little bit more about this during the Renaissance, um, we have our first depiction of rhetoric as a human. And uh, this character was created called Dame Rhetoric. Rhetoric was represented artistically as a woman with a sword, and that's her. And this particular picture of her comes from a set of tarot cards after a uh, Renaissance artist named Andrea de Montaigne. I'll show you one of his paintings when we talk about the Renaissance. Anyway, that wraps up my uh, talk about rhetoric and Christianity. I think it's a pretty interesting topic. And so now you've heard about both Roman and Christian rhetoric. Your next paper is going to be a choice between uh, a paper on Roman rhetoric or a paper on Christian rhetoric. I'll assign that uh, before the weekend's out. And I hope to have all the second papers that you've written done by this weekend. So thanks for listening and uh, take care.